Okay, I'm just quickly go over um, the Houdini engine. So in the file that I sent, um, there is this little TXT file with all the sources that I will be using uh, today. So the first one uh, is the, the the one that's about Houdini engine itself. So when it comes to installation of Houdini engine, because again, this is something that you need to just um, to, to use Houdini with Unreal. Um, this is the uh, official documentation page for uh, Houdini engine for Unreal. And here under the getting started, it's all nicely explained uh, how to install Houdini engine as a plugin. So uh, what you do is basically while you're installing Houdini, uh, you need to enable Houdini engine for Unreal. And then within your Houdini directory, uh, there will be a folder with the plugin. And then you need to copy that folder to your uh, Unreal Engine, um, to your, um, Unreal Engine directory, basically. Uh, and then you will have the plugin itself in Unreal. You need to enable it. You have it, but you still won't be able to use it uh, because if you want to use it, you need to have a license for it. And to be fair, Houdini has like the most complicated licenses ever, um, and there's so many names and they're so like hard to manage. I think. Uh, but yeah, uh, the license to use the plugin is called Houdini, yeah, it's a uh, Houdini for Unreal license and it's free, so you can use it. So if you just download Houdini, um, and, uh, if you just download Houdini and you just open for the first time, you don't have any license, it's going to ask you if you would like to, um, enable your Houdini apprentice license, which is just like a free Houdini, which is, has some limited features, but it's, it has the most important stuff there. Um, which is like just doing stuff in Houdini, uh, basically. And within this license, you can also create HDAs. Uh, and this one allows you to use HDAs in uh, Unreal. So basically, with these two that are free, you, would, you, should, you will be able to follow the workshop and stuff. And there's just like one feature that I will use during the workshop that I will mention that this one uh, doesn't, uh, is not in the free version. Uh, but I, I have it because my uh, license I have right now is the education license because I'm in school. Um, so, but I'm going to mention it, but m most of the stuff, like, it's it's okay with the, via the free version. Okay, so uh, I'm going to open up uh, the project. So within the folder, there's also the Unreal project. It's just, it's just an empty Unreal project, almost empty, with just some stuff that I included already, so I don't need to, like, import them. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly open it up. All right. Uh, so this is just an empty level and I just imported some of the stuff yeah, already here. Uh, so if you want to enable the plugin after you install it in the folder, you go to plugins and here you need to enable the, uh, the plugin itself and you probably need to restart uh, um, Unreal as well. And uh, if it works, you're going to have here a little tab with Houdini engine and a bunch of stuff. You use like three buttons from this, so no worries about all of this, the whole, this whole menu. And uh, if you'd like to test if it works correctly, uh, I include it in the project under the HDA folder. Uh, there's a folder Houdini free tools. And I got it from uh, over here. Uh, there's this uh, bunch of tools from Unreal Starter Kit. And this is like a starter kit because Houdini once made a game jam. Um, sorry, just like Houdini jam or something. Um, and they included some of free tools to like sh kind of show how you can use Houdini within it. So, so I just uh, downloaded them from, from here and I put them in the, in the project. So if you go here, you have a bunch of free tools. Uh, so if you want to test if your Houdini engine works, you can just drag and drop it. And first you're going to see a Houdini logo in, instead of this, uh, because it's, it's uh, waiting for inputs. And if it doesn't need any inputs, it's just going to generate the mesh. And for example, here we have Little Rock. And uh, yeah, now I'm just going to quickly go to the interface of the of the plugin. So uh, I just put the outliner together, so this window is going to be uh, bigger. So I have the uh, Houdini selected. Uh, Houdini assets selected, and as you can see, Houdini assets have like the little Houdini logo here, so you can uh, easily see it's them. And this is like a huge uh, interface of the of the Houdini um, asset. So just going from the start, um, the first thing th these buttons here, they're basically for like refreshing your tool. So what recooking does is just if you changed input somehow and it didn't change for some reason because it's usually recooking automatically, you can just press this button. And it's gonna get recooked, so it's gonna try to calculate everything again and create the mesh. Uh, rebuilding is kind of re like recooking, but just more. So it's gonna like really make sure that everything is there. So it's gonna uh, re-import the file. It's gonna update it. It's gonna destroy this actor. It's gonna then create a new actor, and it's gonna force it to recook. Uh, it's just, I just read the line basically, but more dramatically. So usually, if like you made some updates and nothing is changing, you just need to press this button, and it's just gonna run the tool basically again, and then it should be all okay. Uh, and then, yeah, reset pa parameters is for resetting parameters. And then the next one is baking. Uh, so right now this asset is in here, 
as a Houdini asset. Uh, so if you would like to share a file with somebody who doesn't have Houdini plugin, uh, then it obviously won't work because it can get calculated. Um, so then you need to bake your asset, which is just changing it to geometry. So right now here on the top, you can see that this asset is actually two instant setting mesh components. Uh, and if we now press bake, we're going to get this mesh over here. Exactly the same one. It's, it's a bit different for some reason, actually. I'm not sure why. Um, and here you can see that it just created a blueprint. Uh, actually, two blueprints. No. Ah, that's why it's different. Yeah, because this is the, the other part of it. Uh, so it created two blueprints. Uh, and these two blueprints have just an instant setting mesh component inside, and that's more or less what like most of the Houdini tools do. So when you bake something, it just gets um, made as geometry, and you can find it actually in your content browser. Whenever you run any Houdini tool, uh, there's going to be a Houdini engine folder created, and in this case, I have uh, the temp folder with some stuff from uh, when I was testing um, before the workshop, and you can see here like, uh, like these meshes that were created uh, for this tool. Um, and also there's, I think there should be like some Houdini assets, just like, you know, a folder for Houdini to make stuff, basically, that it's using. Okay, let's go back to the Houdini tool over here. Okay, so then the next step is parameters. Uh, so parameters is basically anything that you exposed in your HDA. So this is, you know, the whole parameters tab is basically built by you in Houdini. So you can, like, just a simple example, you have the seed value, change the seed value, the asset changes automatically. Uh, and I think it's, you know, this is basically the whole, the whole Houdini uh, parameters, just normal this in Houdini. And then uh, last one is Houdini outputs. So this basically shows you what uh, Houdini is doing and what it's actually outputting in the tool. And I'm going to be honest, it's just like a bunch of uh, different meshes and geometry. Uh, you can do some stuff with it, uh, but it's just like, you usually don't look at it um, that often. Okay. Uh, so that's it for like the usual um, interface of the tool. Mm. I'm going to go now quickly over the inputs that uh, you can also use because um, just, just to show what, what, uh, what's there. So usually the inputs there, sometimes there's a separate tab for the inputs, uh, but this tool was made the way that the inputs are inside of the parameters. So it's over here and you can see there's just like a huge, huge menu. This is the menu for an input. So this tool in particular, uh, by default, just creates some kind of mesh, uh, but you can also give it an input and then it's going to change this input into a rock. So the default is geometry input and geometry input just takes any asset from your content browser. So I can just go here and choose like a sphere and then I'm going to have uh, a rock in the shape of a sphere, for example, and it works perfectly. Uh, so this is like the, the most default um, input that you can use. Another one is uh, curve input, which right now is going to look a bit weird uh, because it just creates um, a default Unreal spline um, that then you can use as an input for your tool. So if you hold alt and drag, uh, it just works like a regular Unreal Spline. And there is actually a tool in here um, that uses them. So if you go to the free tools, you can go to pipe. Okay. And as you can see, this is like a pipe built based on the, on the curve. So we have a curve and then this curve is being changed into a pipe, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So this is the, the curve input. And then the next one is asset input. So asset input uh, actually means uh, Houdini asset input. So if you have more uh, Houdini tools around that like maybe can interact with each other, then that's what you should use. Uh, so for example, here in the list, I can see that I have the pipe uh, one, and if I click on it, and I uh, then the pipe is going to be changed into little rocks, as you can see. Uh, and this is actually faster because you can also, you know, you can also what you could do is you could just use this uh, pipe as ge a separate geometry. So like you kind of like export it and then you like import it to the tool. But actually, if you use the asset input, then they're going to get linked directly in Houdini. Um, so this is actually faster if you have that kind of chain of tools. For example, you can have like a tool that like uh, makes some kind of wall and then you can have another tool that's uh, destroying the edges a little bit or something like that. And then you can have another tool that puts um, an ivy on it and you can just build on it like that. And the next one is landscape input, uh, which is for landscapes. Uh, so this is when you do some type of landscapes, some, some road, some high fields, stuff like that. And then the world outline input is actually really, really cool. Uh, this is the one that um, I've been using, that usually use when you have like yeah, building creation and stuff like that. So world outline input uses objects from the scene itself. So for example, what I can do is I can just uh, place some cubes and some spheres. Let's say like, this is a cube. Okay, and then I can place um, a cylinder. Okay, and I'm just gonna place them together over here. Like so. And then what I can do is I can go to the tool itself. I can choose the word outliner input, okay, and then I click on start selection. And I'm gonna select these two objects 
use current selection. And now, as you can see, these objects have been used as an input. And usually, you also need to hide them. It was the same thing with the pipe, that you need to hide them as well. And then you get the shape uh, of these objects you've selected, which is also really nice because you don't need to... You can use just your block out meshes for an input instead of like having a separate mesh built somewhere or like convert it to, a, a, to an asset or anything like that. Okay, let me unhide the... We didn't need to order delete it. No, I think I just... Okay, it's just, it's just there, yeah. Just the logo. It disappeared. So this is the world aligner input, and I think there's two more. Yeah, there's a skeletal mesh input for, like, yeah, skeletal meshes, um, some simulations, animations, something like that. And there's a, a geometry collection input, which I'm gonna be sure. I've never used geometry collections instead of Unreal. Um, and I'm actually not sure what it is. And uh, also, like, all I've just said, uh, it's all in documentation. So you can also just go here, and uh, I made uh, put a link here to inputs documentation. As you can also just go here and go to inputs. And uh, the last input, the geometry collection, isn't even documented yet. So I just kind of left it because it's, yeah, it appeared very recently. Uh, so I'm not sure what it is. But if you want to know more about inputs and how you can use them, what you can use and what all the patterns are doing, then, you know, just read the documentation and uh, you're going to have everything here. Okay, so that's it for the inputs. It's, I don't want to go over it because I think that it's important for a second to know what you can work with because not everything that's possible in Houdini is possible in Unreal as well. Uh, so that's it. Uh, okay, uh, this is more or less how the Houdini tool uh, works, uh, the, the interface of it, um, all of that stuff. So now we can move on to the tool itself that we're going to make today. Uh, so again, in the little folder I shared, uh, this one, this one, this one. Uh, there's the uh, Houdini to Unreal Start file, which uh, has a little fence tool that I've made, as I mentioned before. Let's open it up. And by the way, I'm using Houdini 19.5. It should be the newest one uh, currently. Okay, so how the tool works is it takes a curve input, so something that we've already seen in Unreal, that we, we can use it. It takes just a simple curve and it makes a fence in that shape. As you can see, it's very simple fence, just, just boxes that are next to each other. But, you know, it's all nice and automatic, so if I go inside this curve and... Whoops, not like that. If I go inside this curve and I can move something... Oh, uh, middle mouse. I can move something... And, you know, now it's breaking because I didn't uh, prepare it for a uh, changing height. Uh, but on a flat surface, it works perfectly. Again, it's a very simple tool. I made it simple on purpose. Um, so here you go. That's how it works. Uh, and let's just dig into how uh, the HDA is built step by step because we will be changing it. Maybe I'm just going to control Z the, uh, the curve. Or I'm going to maybe just go put the transfer mode here, transform node here, and scale it zero on Y. So it's going to be evened out. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the, here's how it works node by node because uh, then we're gonna change it later uh, to work with Unreal, with like Unreal assets. So I think it's important for us to understand exactly. Uh, so first, yeah, we have the cube, uh, then sorry, the cube, the curve, that's an input. Uh, and first thing I'm doing is I'm obviously resampling it. Uh, so uh, this is gonna, that how much I resample, I resample it by segment length and how much I resample is gonna become a distance between the little fence sections. And also I have a habit of uh, whenever I have a node that uses some parameter, I just mark it the green. Uh, just so I know this is a node that changes something. So, uh, you know, look at it, it's important. Uh, so this is the same thing as distance over here, right, for the for the fence. And then I split it to two branches. So the first branch is just the pulse itself. So I just have a little box over here uh, that I expose the size of and I put it on the floor. Uh, and it's copied over points, so these are the, the poles itself. Um, and also something is uh, you can see they are oriented properly along the curve and the reason for it is because here I changed uh, I put normals as the tangent attribute uh, So by default they will be just you know in the same direction as they were created But if you put normal in the tangent uh, Then the curve you can see here preview the normals are gonna point towards each other in the tangent direction uh, so uh, the side effect is poles like this are gonna get oriented properly, which is perfect so this is this is for this branch. We have poles. That's simple as that. And with beams, uh, we have a little bit more work. So I'm gonna just mute all of these, uh, and we're gonna maybe go from the end because that's where the geometry is getting created, right? So how I create geometry from curve, I just sweep it, and there's a profile for a sweep. I just using grid, which I also exposed, uh, and this is becoming a thickness of our beam. So this is the beam itself. And here before it, I also just calculate tangent. This is the same thing um, with polyframes. The same thing that we did earlier in resample. But in these nodes over here, I am touching the normals. Uh, so I had to uh, recalculate it again before the sweeping. I'm going to go back to it. Okay, so this is it. Um, now, first thing to show is uh, to just make them two of them. So I do it in the most simple way. I just move uh, the curve up over here. And then I 
uh, have a copy that's moved down uh, and I merge them together, that's it. You know, you can do it in so many ways because that's, that's the you know, magic, the, the beauty of Houdini, you can do all of this like um, in so many ways, as long as it's simple for users, so you can maybe, I, and now I put it as a height, so like you, you count the height from the ground, but maybe you can do it as uh, you subtract height from the highest point of the pole, or you can do it as some kind of value between zero and one, where zero is the ground and one is the highest um, point on the pole, stuff like that. It's probably a bit user friendly then, uh, but I just left it like this for simplicity uh, sake. Okay, so now we have two beams over here, that's cool. And now the next part is to make it um, go a little bit in front, because right now the poles, uh, the beams are going through the center of the poles. So I just wanted to put them in front of them. Uh, so how I do it, this is uh, this section over here. Uh, so first of all, we need to, uh, this is, you know, this is the input that we're working with. Uh, so we need to move it, uh, you know, in this direction, more or less, um, by like a thickness of a beam or something like that. Uh, so first of all, we need to calculate the direction that they're going to move in. Uh, because for the moving itself, I'm using a peak node, and peak node is a node that just moves um, moves uh, points or whatever you select um, with the direction of normals. So, you know, by default here, again, our normals right now are pointing towards each other. So that's, you see exactly how this um, how these lines are moving, these points, sorry, are moving. Uh, so we want to change normals the way so they will be pointing, like, outwards, let's say, uh, from the poles. So how I do it is I'm using, uh, like, I'm, I'm creating a vector frame, and I can preview it with this node over here. And by the way, this vector frame over here, this code, this is all copied exactly like uh, like it was from one tutorial um, that I also uh, noted here. here. This one is a great tutorial. Uh, and this, this vector frame is actually very much like a starting point for every tool that's curved base, because it gives you directions that you can uh, that you can use together. So what he does here is he just, uh, this is just a simple code. Uh, that uses two cross products uh, between the up vector and the, and the tangent that we've calculated earlier in the resample um, to create these three attributes. So the green arrow is the up vector attribute, then the blue arrow is the normal right now, and the right the red arrow is a right vector. So we have these three attributes over here calculated, um, and then uh, I'm just converting a separate node just for like readability. I'm just transforming uh, right vector to uh, the normal, so then the peak, mo peak node can use it to move. Uh, and just just uh, as a note, something that I forget very often, that's why I just want to uh, stop here. Uh, remember, whenever you use any operations on vectors, just to, like note down this is a vector. So in, in VEX, if you want to say that something is a vector or like a, a string or something, you put the variable uh, letter in front of the attribute uh, sign. Um, and if you wouldn't do it right here, then it wouldn't work because it would think that both normal and right attribute are floats. Uh, so we need to just make sure that it knows its vector. Uh, so then now I just transfer again the right vector, so the, the red arrow to the normal. So then the peak node can move it in the right direction, more or less here. And the amount of how much I move it is half the width of the pole and half the width of the beam. So then it should be exactly in front. And obviously because it's, you know, such a simple tool, it's not always exactly like here, uh, because it's just moving points, but if you look at something like here, this is in front of the pole, so that's really nice. Uh, and then the last part of the tool is to just make these irregular, and the way I did it um, is I used uh, noise uh, in the attribute vop, so I'm gonna go over here, unmute it. Uh, so this is an attribute vop, and uh, inside of it I just have a parallel noise that uses position as an input. And I just take the yeah, position as a seed, um, I run into the noise function, and then I add this no noise function only to the Y uh, position of the of points, uh, and then I plug it in back. So only the Y position is getting affected. And something I did is, uh, maybe I'm gonna go back first, uh, because yeah, right now we have an issue that these all these points are connected together, and because of it, you know, this line is very much continuous, and we don't want that. So we need to separate them. Uh, so the, the uh, way of how we separate lines uh, in Houdini, like the easier way, is to use the carve node. So what carve node does is it has these two nice inputs, which as you can see, they can cut at the beginning and the end. So what you do is you just put it yeah, at the beginning and the end, but right now this is uh, treated as one continuous line. And the reason for it is because um, right now they're here as only two uh, primitives. So we have the primitive for uh, top line and one primitive for the bottom line. And so, because of it, I need to, before it, use the convert line uh, node that you just put it like that. And then uh, these individual lines are being converted into primitives. So now when I use the carve node, 
you can see the beginning and the end is being cut from the individual segments. Um, and then you can see here that the points are being doubled, which is exactly what we need. So then we apply the noise and they're still being continuous. And the reason for it is because uh, as a seed for the noise, we're using position. And you know, these two points have exactly the same position. So the output is going to be also exactly the same. So in order to vary it, I'm just adding the point number to the position. So it's just some different value. And now they have all a little bit different noise applied to them. So that's how I ma again made the irregularity, but there's so many different ways you can do it. You can even just code it with X as well, just like add random value, stuff like that. Um, but th that's the way I did it because I just thought it's gonna be easy to show. Uh, so that's how it is. And also here I exposed the offset and the amplitude, uh, and I also exposed it to the HDA. So over here you see it's in green. And then, yeah, in the end, I need to recalculate the, uh, the normals uh, for the sweep to work because, you know, we, we were touching the normals um, over here in, the, in the, the, the moving part. So if I wouldn't recalculate them, that's how it would look like um, because sweep node is using the normal direction as well. So we need to recalculate it. And this is how our friends looks like. So this is just simple to like that. And now if you want to use it inside of Unreal, let's just open our little project. Um, and here is have an HDA. Uh, what I did, I just saved it as HDA in the same folder. So here you have then also in the file, the HDA folder, you can just drag it in here and it should all be good. Now you have the file over here and if you put it, you're gonna have the Houdini uh, icon for a bit. And the reason why it's the Houdini icon is not changing is because yeah, it defaults to geometry input. Uh, so we just change it to the curve input and now you can, you have the curve and it works nice and you can just alt drag and it's gonna create a fence and here and well, it has some issues. It's a very simple tool, uh, but yeah, you have all the parameters um, that, that you want to change, right? Um, and here you can change. Uh, these are all the parameters that I've exposed. So again, like the parameters the tab is all, um, you know, it's all according to whatever you want. Last one, just know the amp amplitude and this issue is already fixed. Uh, so that's, that's also like one of the things with, with tools. You want them to be foolproof, but sometimes like the user also just needs to know how to use the tool. But yeah, this is just a very, very simple uh, very simple one, that's why it has uh, some issues. Okay, so that's how it works. And now let's uh, move to the, the part where we actually finally use the Unreal Assets. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make this um, make this fence tool use actual assets and not just like cubes that are also like generated from, um, from Houdini. Uh, so what I have is in the same file, I just put some planks uh, and some and a pole that I will be using to create this fence uh, later. So this is the pole that we will uh, switch this pole for and just a bunch of planks that we will use as the beams basically um, So we have this asset within the within the project and now we just need to you know very easy task just uh, Change them which obviously is gonna you know take us like an hour right now, but um, it's worth it. Okay uh, So let's uh, let's get to it. Let's need to have a break uh, I'm gonna go to this file and I'm just gonna quickly copy over the HDA so control C control V or alt drag I'm gonna rename it to Fence Unreal, and I'm gonna save it as another HDA. So digital asset, save as, and I'm gonna change this to Fence Unreal, and everything as is fine. I'm gonna change this to hip uh, file directory just so I have it in the same place, and I'm gonna press Create. Uh, and also something that I would like to note down. Is that as you saw earlier um, we had it uh, it's the input defaulted to geometry input uh, and if, or if you want to have it by default on curve input then you just put the name over here so if you have like a, a keyword like curve or landscape or assets in here then Houdini is gonna um, yeah good 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 point trees mm. Houdini is gonna default to that uh, to that input so I'm just gonna press apply accept uh, and also I'm just going to save this file as a different one. So without start graphics. Okay. Okay. So just quickly see, you know, if it still works. Uh, and also just so we can quickly update it. Let's put it in here. This is our fence unreal. And now as you can see, if I put it in here, it's going to default to the curve input, which is perfect. I just want to show that. Um, because it's something that you should write, like, just do uh, when you create the HDA straight away. Okay. So first... So the, the easy part, so the poles, which is just only copying, right? Um, so we instead of this box, we want to have the uh, the pole. And the way you do it uh, in Houdini is basically you need to uh, tell where you want to uh, copy these poles. And then you tell, 
Okay, I think I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do it, uh, and it's gonna get maybe more, uh, more, uh, more visible. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this curve. I'm gonna just remove this copy to points because we very much don't need it right now, and I'm gonna create an uh, attribute create node. Okay, uh, plug it in here, and then put it back into the merge node. And the reason why I created an attribute uh, create node is because basically the whole communication between Houdini and Unreal is happening within like different attributes that Unreal just knows needs to look for. So again, in the little source file I prepared, uh, there is the uh, this one attributes documentation. Okay, over here, just <laughs> the, the tab above. And this is just a lots of parameters that uh, uh, Unreal can read from Houdini uh, files, basically Houdini assets, actually. And the one that we will be using the most is called uh, Unreal Instance. Uh, so as you can see, you can put this on either point or detail, and it's a string type of attribute. And within this uh, parameter, what you do is you put a path to the, um, to the asset that you want to use. So the simplest way to just, it's mostly just for testing, here, again, it's an attribute, you need to put exactly that name, because this is the one that's going to be uh, detected by Unreal. And then you change this to be a string, and I have it on points as well. And then I'm going to go to Unreal, and I'm going to use the, go to the poll, I'm going to find it, and I'm going to copy reference, okay? And now I'm going to paste it over here, and I'm going to save the note by right-clicking, save note type, Going back to Unreal, it's like a loop you're gonna do a bunch of times. I'm gonna press rebuild so it reimports. And now, just like that, as you can see, the boxes have been changed to the poll, uh, which is pretty pretty cool. Uh, we will have some issues still with it. Like it just it's copied, right? You, you can't really uh, control scale yet or, or orientation. But this is just to show this is like the basic way of copying, um, of of, of using, um, of using um, um, Unreal assets within the Houdini. Um, uh, tool. And another thing is that, you know, there's a bunch of ways, because usually, obviously, this is not really user-friendly, because, uh, yeah, maybe you would like to expose this, but this is, like, you know, this is a, as a string, because also, if you expose it, uh, I'm gonna quickly show it, so if I go to type properties and go to parameters, I'm gonna remove this, okay, okay I'm gonna leave it still, because it's used by our, by the moving uh, beams here, but I'm gonna quickly just drag it in here, so it's gonna get exposed, apply accept, and as you can see, you know, I rebuild, over here in pulse. As you can see now, we have the string attribute, uh, and you don't need to copy it. If you just drag and drop it, oops, if you just drag and drop asset over here, it's also gonna work. So let's just drag this beam over here. And it also works like this, so it's actually more user friendly than you would think. Uh, but you know, it's, it's not perfect, but uh, I think this is like a nice way, especially like in the beginning when you're just testing a tool, it's really, uh, it's really nice and easy to just use that way. And also, if you would like to know more about instancing, there is this very good official side effects tutorial. Uh, about instancing, if you go over here, okay, uh, which is basically showing what I just showed, uh, but also showing some more variety about how to randomize uh, assets as well and stuff like that. So if you want to like see exactly a step by step how instancing works, um, that's uh, that's that's the way to, that's the video to to see. Because also a really cool thing about this instancing thing is that as I showed earlier, uh, when I have you know a tool like this, uh, and I wanna press bake right now, okay, so I get. A, uh, a blueprint with the Houdini, with whatever Houdini created. Yeah. Uh, as you can see here in this in this blueprint, we just have a static mesh component, and the static mesh component has this asset that you know was generated by the by the Houdini tool over here. But you know, like these all these poles and all these beams are very much repeated assets, so it's not like it has to generate all the geometry. And here you can see uh, in this fence. <coughs> sorry, in this fence. If I go over here, I can see that it has both static mesh component with, okay, I'm gonna bake it just so this changes to an actual asset. So I'm gonna bake it and now go over here. And you can see it has uh, two blueprints now. And yeah, one of them is still static mesh component that generates this geometry, but the one that we already changed is an instant static mesh component. And it actually is using, you know, the asset that we have inside Unreal. And it looks really innocent, but instancing, with instancing you can you can have a lot, a lot of objects in the scene at the same time. So um, it's, you know, it's it's really, really, really optimized. And um, I'm actually this one video. I'm not sure if I noted it here. No, I didn't. Uh, but if you would like to know more about like instancing within Unreal, let me quickly find it. This one 
uh, is, is a pretty long one, but it basically shows how to set up um, a, a blueprint uh, like the one over here uh, that, that Houdini created for us uh, yourself. And it just shows like how many like objects you can have because of instancing on the scene. So this is pretty amazing. All right. So we have the poles. And now let's go to the beams, which are, you know, a little bit uh, longer of a road. So uh, let's just do the same thing that we've already done. Uh, so here in the end, instead of creating a geometry over the line, let's copy the, the beam that we have, uh, the plank that we have uh, to these lines. So here, first we have an issue because you no, know, we copy these um, these um, assets to the points, and here the points are at the ends of lines, so we need them to be in the middle of a line. And I'm saying in the middle because you know the way I created these planks is I put the origin point in the middle. So this is also something that you very much need to think of when you create assets: is like how are you gonna use them within your tool? Because you know, if for example, uh, this should be like a fence that has poles sticking up then I would probably put the origin point um, at the start, just like I did with the pole, right? So then when I, for example, scale them, they're going to uh, rise up and not to the down not, not down as well. But in case of, in case of planks, I, I thought it made sense to put the origin point in the middle. So I also need to have a point in the middle. So the way you do it is also you know, a way that I, again, got from another tutorial. Uh, I just want to point my uh, sources, uh, which is five ways to replace remove a point, which is really, really cool. It showed me a bunch of cool notes. Uh, that I'm using till this day. So this is just, yeah, a bunch of ways of how to create point at the center, which is actually really useful when you're doing something like, yeah, uh, tools for Unreal, where, like, the whole location is basically dictated by uh, by points, right? Uh, and you not not always, you can't always use, like, the one method that you always go for. Uh, so one of the methods that he showed is what he's doing. I'm just gonna... Uh, I'm gonna delete this frame. Okay, over here. And so we just have these curves. Uh, what he's doing is he's using primitive properties node. Okay. And primitive properties, uh, you have something like do transformation, uh, th this tab. And this tab basically is like the transform node, but it's doing it per primitive. So right now we separate the primitives earlier here with the uh, convert line. So all the lines are separate primitives and we can just scale them to zero on all the axes. And then we're going to get a point uh, in the middle, which is really nice. But they're obviously doubled still. So we're just going to uh, fuse them so they're not and now they all disappeared because fuse node automatically gets rid of floating points so you just need to uh, disable this option remove unused points from original primitives and now we have single points in the middle of these lines that we had here which is absolutely amazing uh, okay as you can see so now we can use these points to uh, copy these poles so again I'm gonna use the same method that I used earlier and I'm gonna show another method for instancing as well uh, later, but let's stick to it because it's also really nice for yeah for just testing. So attribute create, uh, and I'm gonna call it actually um, beam instancing, and I'm gonna call the other one as well as pull instance. Okay, uh, let's change this to string, and now let's copy. Just yeah, this this plank is fine, perfect. Uh, copy reference and let's copy this over here. Okay, and now let's save it. So save note type and I'm gonna rebuild this tool over here. Okay, okay, so we got uh, we got orange boxes and orange boxes usually mean that hey there is I, I am I want to have some kind of uh, asset but I don't I, I don't get it I can't find it. So I think we had to uh, do something when I was copying. Uh, but I'm honestly not sure. All right, right here we go. Uh, I didn't change the attribute name, so that's why. So as you can see, like we got a point, and which was a point, and uh, and uh, Andre was like, I have a point. This probably should be something on it, but I don't have anything. So display the boxes. So make sure the attribute name is correct, and let's save and rebuild. Okay, and here we go. Here are our beams, right? But it's obviously something wrong with them because yeah, right now we only learn how we can uh, manipulate location because my location is where the points are, but we still need to uh, learn how to manipulate uh, rotation and scale, okay? So maybe let's start with uh, scale first. I'm just gonna make some more complicated curve, so uh, we're gonna see all of these changes, okay? As you can see, poles are also just, you know, straight up, but we're gonna fix it in a second. So let's go with scale first. So something I did when I was making these uh, planks, that actually when I was creating them, they were looking more like this, okay? So now they're like squished. 
But what I did before the workshop um, is I changed them to have exactly one meter of a size. So when we are calculating the length uh, of what, what length they should have between the fences, I don't need to do some weird math to normalize them and then multiply them by the length. I can just multiply them by the length straight away and it's going to be all fine. Um, okay, so uh, let's do so. So in order to scale assets correctly, uh, there's another attribute that um, uh, that takes care of it, which is called scale. No, uh, surprise, surprise. So I'm going to use an attribute wrangler with it, this one, uh, not create, because if we just create it, um, then we would be able to, you know, give the scale um, the scale manipulation to the user, but we wanted to calculate it actually per line, right? So I'm actually need to do it. Um, okay, I think I think we can do it here. Okay, let's call it uh, beam scale or like length. Okay. Um, so now what we need to do is uh, just first just put the scale attribute here and see how it works. Okay, so we have the scale. Uh, so it's an attribute scale, and then uh, I can just make it a vector, and let's say that it's uh, one, two, one, one. I, I think I made them length on the x-axis. Uh, because of this XYZ, obviously. Uh, okay, and now you can see in the geometry spreadsheet that I have over here always uh, that yeah, the scale is set as 2, 1, 1. Uh, and let's save this and see how the planks are going to look like. Okay, so I saved it, rebuilt it. Okay, and as you see, the planks are longer as expected. That's perfect. But our pulse disappeared for some reason. And we just added scale. So something that's happening is something that you need to be aware. Like, yeah, test your tool often because sometimes stuff happens and you're not sure what you did in this your whole session that it, uh, it's uh, disappeared. The reason for it is because um, earlier, none of these branches, this branch nor this branch, had a scale parameter. But now we add a scale parameter here. And then when we merge them, uh, as you can see, the, sc uh, the scale parameter needs to, like, the points from the poles, they need to have some kind of value there, and it defaults to zero. So right now our poles have scale of zero, and then we go further and the beams have sc a scale of 211. Uh, so what we need to do is we also need to set the scale for uh, for the poles, and maybe we can do it with uh, attribute create, uh, because we won't be re-changing. Uh, we don't need to calculate anything for it. Uh, so this is an attribute called scale, and it's a vector attribute. Uh, I'm not sure which one of these never goes, I always do both. And this is just one. So let's call it pole scale. And we will be able to... Um, and this is also something that you could like expose as well. Okay, so save node type and now let's rebuild. Okay, and the poles are back. That's great. So this was this was actually the issue. Um, so now let's calculate the length, right? Because now we just set it as two, but we want it to be exactly the length of the... Um, of the... Um, of the beam. Uh, now I'm thinking about it, I probably should have done the orientation first, but let's just roll with the scale um, still. Okay, so here we go. Uh, so we need to first know the scale, the, the length actually of these these lines, these lines over here, right? Uh, so actually convert line already calculates scale for us by default. So it's it's creating a attribute called rest length and it's stored on primitive. So if you can see here, here on uh, in the primitive, we have an attribute called rest length. That's a length of uh, lines. But the thing is, later we you know still move them up and down. We don't rotate them; we move them, so they're gonna get a little bit longer. So uh, I will measure the the length uh, one more time. So we're gonna do it with the measure node. So I'm gonna just put it over here, and it by default measures area. So I'm just gonna change this to perimeter length, and it defaults the name to perimeter. It's fine, and as you can see, it's a little bit bigger um, than the rest length. It's probably you know small of a difference, but I just want to show that you can use this node. Um, and then uh, this is, you know, with the primitive node, uh, we're uh, scaling the primitive to zero. This is still here, but when we fuse them, uh, we don't have primitives anymore, right? Because they're only points, so this param this, uh, this here is just empty, and we don't have the length anymore over here. So in order to not lose it, uh, we are going to promote it to points first. So I'm going to use attribute promote before I fuse over here. And I want to uh, do it from primitive to point, and I want it to be the uh, perimeter attribute, okay? So now you can see here it's still in primitives. Ooh, here. Here it's still in primitives, but here it's not here anymore. Now it's somewhere there, here, in points. And after we fuse it, it should still be here, as you can see. So uh, it got it got transferred in. Here it's doubled because, you know, bo bo they, every line has two points. Uh, and then we have twice as little, but all these uh, attributes stay, so that's perfect. And now we can use this perimeter as a scale, right? So we're gonna go to our 
um, little vex block uh, that calculates the scale, that sets the scale. And here instead of two, we're gonna set the parameter attribute. So again, just place parameter. I'm not sure if that's how it's spelled. I'm just gonna quickly check. Um, okay, yeah, that's cool. Uh, so parameter, okay. Uh, now we have an issue here. Uh, we get an error, uh, unexpected identifier. The reason for that error is because you cannot, if, whenever you start using some kind of math or um, yeah, attributes inside, you can't use the like, early brackets to set vectors anymore. You need to use a set uh, function. So over here, uh, now it's all good. And you can see here, if we go to scale, you can see that the uh, value on X is whatever our perimeter was earlier, which is really nice. Uh, so now if I'm going to save this and I'm going to rebuild, now you can see the length started to vary and we don't see it if it's the proper one, but we can trust it's the proper one. Uh, so we have the length already set uh, and now we can do the orientation, so rotation. Uh, I said orientation because it's the attribute that we're going to use. Um, so actually, you know, when we look at our points, uh, the normal, it's actually still very much very correct. Um, so here, I believe we calculated, yeah, here with the polyframe. Oh, I removed the polyframe. Okay, so I'm gonna put the polyframe back uh, before we um, make the uh, make the, the points, right? So now we have the tangent uh, back, and as you can see here, uh, the points the the points actually still point the, the point normals still point uh, in the right direction. So you could think if you would right now use box, not bone capture uh, box, and you would put it to copy two points, then actually in and Houdini, everything will be cool. Uh, so I'm gonna put this as, oops, this is a geometry, this is curves. Okay, everything will be cool. As you can see, they're pretty big, uh, but they are oriented in the right way as the beams should um, over here, right? Okay, they're rotated 90 degrees right now, uh, but if I would change the scale like this, you can see they're oriented the right way, uh, but somehow in Unreal, they're not. And the reason for it is because Unreal doesn't really read the normal attribute. Um, like, it reads it, but it actually uses it for normals and not orientation direction, stuff like that. Uh, so in order to change this, to, in order to rotate anything uh, in Unreal, we need to uh, change these normals to be an orient attribute. Uh, so if you want to learn more about the Unreal attribute, uh, it's it's a matrix uh, So over here. Um, so if I, pro for example, put orient here, uh, this is a four va four vector one one, uh, and I'm not gonna put any values here actually because I'm not gonna pretend like I know the values uh, because yeah this is uh, this is uh, yeah, I forgot the name a qua 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 I'm gonna quickly show you the source and that's where the uh, name is gonna be shown so here um, the source is joy of x uh, class about orient okay so by the way joy of x really nice source of, um, of if you want to like just learn how to use VEX. Uh, quaternions, quaternions, yeah, that's what I wanted to, it just got of stress. Um, so quaternions, uh, so quaternions are, you know, a four vector, uh, but there's a really, really nice function inside of VEX that just makes you change normals to quaternions and you don't really need to know the values next to that. So if you scroll down somewhere over here, there should be a function here, make transform. So this is uh, a function that's gonna change um, uh, your normals to an orient. So if I just copy this line over here, okay, and this is an up vector, so I'm just gonna change it to be 0, 1, 0. So Y up in Houdini, and I'm gonna change this to be beam orient. Okay, uh, let's put it on, let's save it. And let's see what it did. Okay, yeah, they're actually oriented, you know, pretty well. It's, we have the same issue that we had earlier, uh, so they're rotated 90 degrees, but you can see now the normals have been changed um, to the orient attribute and the orientation is changed, so that's that's really nice. And so now it is rotated 90 degrees, so that's, again, another, you know, piece of code uh, that you can find in this website. I'm just showing you the... Um, I'm just showing you the, the, the source of it, because, you know, like, I'm, I'm basically just copying code. I'm showing that it's not like I... I'm, I'm so smart that I, I just read documentation and I figured out I'm just copying code from people who are smarter than me, uh, which is, you know, what all people who do, like, programming or scripting do, basically. So this, this piece of code, very nice piece of code. 
um, here, Houdini. I'm gonna copy it over. It's actually something that I, at this point, have under my presets. So here I have the vector frame a preset, I have normal to orient uh, as well. It's actually just these two, these are the most important ones, I think. Uh, so it's this piece of code. Uh, so here, what it does is it's making the same thing. So uh, make transform with normal and up. But I'm just gonna quickly change it because um, this normal is actually based on position from this code. So I'm gonna remove this actually. And I'm gonna do it like we did it earlier. So I'm gonna make this our normal attribute and up is just 0, 1, 0. Okay. Uh, and this I can remove as well. Okay. And then uh, what's happening is uh, there's an extra rotation uh, vector for created, which is a quaternion uh, that uses some kind of angle. So this, uh, if in Vex, you use this kind of syntax. So you have ch from channel and then a name. And then you can use it as a parameter uh, with a slider uh, below. But I'm just going to change it to 90 because we know it's going to be 90 degrees. And I would like to, this is the axis on which we're going to rotate. So I want to rotate it on the y axis or like the up axis, right? Um, because in, in Unreal, it's going to be that actually. And then uh, what's happening is the orient is getting multiplied with this extra rotation that we've created here. Okay, so this again, this is the quaternion that says 90 degrees on the y axis. So let's save this. <coughs> let's rebuild. And works. Perfect. Okay, so now we rotated it 90 degrees. And as you can see, uh, they're also as uh, nicely. There's the, the non-uniformity that we had earlier, which is really cool. And something we can also do is we can do the same thing uh, for the poles, because as you can see, the poles are also straight, uh, put straight right now. So I'm going to just copy this part of code over here. Uh, I'm going to use the attribute wrangler. Over here. Um, that's not it. That's one. Okay. And let's call it pole. Orient. Let's save it. And if we rebuild now, cool. We have the balls also really well. Uh, so this is the tool. Uh, we have still one thing to do, uh, which is, as you can see, the length also works well. Uh, so this is great. It means we didn't make any mistake when we were setting up the scale. And uh, yeah, that's pretty looking pretty all right, I think. Uh, one thing, more thing that I did in this tool uh, that I didn't do in this one is the moving of the beams, right? So right now uh, they are being copied exactly to the center. Uh, so they are going basically toward to the pole. It's not really, you know, it's not really perfect because it's a simple tool, but I would still like to show uh, how to put them in front because it's also um, gonna show another type of uh, input that you can use uh, and not that is not like an Unreal instance parameter. Uh, so I would still like to do it. And, but before that, uh, just, you know, just like a quick, um, thing because the thing with Houdini tools is that they're never done, right? You can always change something, you can always make something better. So like, you know, like right now here, like the noise I'm using is not really cool, like it's glitching pretty often. So for example, don't like it. But for example, what you can also do is, you know, we already changed how to show, uh, we already saw how to change orientation and how to change um, uh, scale, right? So for example, what you could do is instead of having this noise that I have, you could maybe have um, the orientation that's getting a randomized angle between like, Let's say you say we have a randomized angle between minus 15 and 15, and then this is going to be the rotation that these poles have, for example, right? Or also what you could do is um, you can make the width random. So we can, maybe I'm going to actually show this one. So let's, so right now, you know, all these punks, they, they're the same asset. So the width uh, is also the same. And the width, uh, I think in the case of this asset is the, um, it's on the Z value uh, on Z. Uh, Z axis. Uh, so maybe we can randomize it a bit as well, right? So let's go to the node that actually makes the the scale. So let's change it from beam length to beam scale. Okay. And let's make it randomize. So um, let's make it, let's make a new parameter float uh, with. And this is going to be a random value. So this is a run function. Uh, and then you put some value as a seed. So usually it's uh, the uh, point number. And then this one we can fit. This is gonna, you know, generate a random value between zero and one, and then we can fit this. Let's say this is between uh, the first ar parameter ar argument of uh, the fit function is the value that you wanna fit. Then you have the uh, start uh, start min and max and the end min and max. So we're gonna create, make it as a channel. So what you see earlier, if you put channel, and I'm putting float. Actually, I don't need to do it. Um, it's a habit. And this is gonna be uh, min width. That's how we're gonna call it, and then. The last parameter 
as the max width. So channel and then max width. Control enter uh, to submit. And now we don't see them yet. We need to click on this little plus over here uh, to have these sliders over there. And I'm gonna make it maybe that minimum width. It's also it's, it's not only width, right? It's more like a scale because it's getting multiplied. So let's say this is gonna be from 0 0.9 till to 1.2 by default. And something I like to do with these minimum maximum values is uh, I make them a vector two in the parameters. So I'm gonna go to float vector two and I'm gonna put it in the beams. And we don't, maybe let's put it, let's remove the beam size uh, already. Actually not because it's still it's still being used uh, sadly in the in this node here. So I'm gonna remove it after we get rid uh, after we get rid of the system and we change it. Um, so I'm gonna just leave it for now. And now I'm gonna make it, uh, I'm gonna call it beams width. And I usually put like in brackets min max. Okay, and then uh, I'm gonna um, put it, yeah, as default 0 0.9 and 1.2. Apply accept. And now we can just copy it over beams size. Uh, here, min max. Uh, and now we can copy this to the parameters over here. Paste. And it's probably a parameter Y. You should name it, right? But I I haven't. Uh, save node type. And now if we rebuild. Okay, nothing has changed. We're gonna see if something's gonna change or not. Uh, so we have here, let's put it as two. Okay, nothing has changed. I think that's because I put it on, on the wire, right? So I think this is changing it in this axis. I just test my theory by putting like a 10 over here. No, it's just not working. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, yeah, so first of all, no, I put it in the. Oh yeah, of course, <laughs> I, I created the value, but then put it in the uh, in the in the scale attribute. So let's put put this value that we've just created in the scale and just save it, and now rebuild it. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so it's actually now in the wrong uh, in the wrong axis. There's also something that you know. Let's put this on one and this on with. It's really just guess the axis is. We all do. Okay, here we go. So let's put it between yeah, 0 0.9 and 1.2, let's say. And now we have some variation in the in the width. Maybe the one five. Here we go. So now it's randomized as well. And you can, you know, we can just keep building like this. And another thing right now, right, is that um these beams, uh they're one asset, but we have I, I've modeled, you know, multiple planks. Maybe I want to use, you know, multiple of them. So something that you can do. Uh, in this method that we're using, it's also shown in that video I sent, is in the attribute create, uh, here, attribute create, uh, you can change this, uh, no, actually no, this is another node, it's called attribute randomize, which yeah, make, uh, easily allows you to create a random attribute of, of, of sorts, uh, so it's, we're gonna remove this one, uh, call it unreal instance, and it's gonna go as uh, custom discrete, and here I'm gonna just default it to one. Uh, so this is, you know, this is kind of like an interface that uh, creates random values, and also it's gonna be a string. So the random string is gonna get, uh, you know, assigned to points. And here you can also choose weight of it, which is really, really cool and really, really useful in case of like, you know, randomized uh, assets. So I'm gonna default it to one, and I'm gonna change this to uh, big instance, uh, which is too old, and just so we know. Okay, uh, and now we can just put it over here. So let's, uh, yeah, this, this is gonna get pretty messy probably uh, during this. So let's just drag the number of values over here. And I'm gonna change the folder name to uh, beams assets. Okay, and it just created like a, I forgot the name as well. Uh, but it's like, you know, um, interactive um, kind of interface, which is really, really nice. Uh, I can save it. I can rebuild it to get all the changes, and you know now again I have the cubes which are properly scale oriented, <laughs> uh, but we don't have the the beams yet. So here in the beams asset, you can change, you can add more. Uh, so okay, I think I didn't change it to string. I didn't change it to string. So why is this? Why is this wrong? It's probably right. I was messing around. What if I add more? Oh, right. I'm sorry. Uh, this is the, the string attribute, obviously. 
uh, and the float is here because I didn't hide it because by default uh, these have both float and uh, and string and you can just go over here and you can make the this is the string value and this is the value in the float so you can just make it invisible and then it's gonna be nice and clean so just save it okay and now we have uh, now if we rebuild we don't yet have it if we rebuild yeah now we have only the string value uh, visible so I can open up my content browser and I can just put let's say three beams that I have here and they're gonna get randomized between all these places and I also can make for example I want this one to be more often visible and it should work just like so uh, so yeah now you know they're very similar so it's not as uh, vi visible but for example in the you can have like in the building tool you know different types of windows for example um and then you no know, like actually have more variety because these are these are just beams but as you can say they change and i think it's pretty cool okay uh so yeah let's go back to this uh, last part um of the oh, of the tool that we already had which is moving the beams a little bit to the side uh, so now we have kind of an issue uh, we hit, uh, hit kind of a wall uh, because you can see um, we don't really have information about size of the pole because how we did earlier is we took uh, the pole size and the, the beam size and we just divided by two easy peasy right uh, but now we only have points and the information about the beam is you know it's put inside of Unreal after the Houdini so we can't really we can re see it. Uh, but there's a workaround around this, and I just want to quickly show. And the workaround is with using the object merge node. So, uh, object merge node is how it's working. It's the same node as merge, but instead of getting um, like lines towards an input, it just takes a path. So, for example, here I have a node with a, f uh, with a, um, with a curve. I can just put the path to this node, and then it's going to be displayed here as well. And I can add another one. And let's say that I want to have um, this grid that I have over here, right? So I can add it. I go to beams profile. And now I have both of them merged here in this one node. That's how it works. And what's cool about it is that it also can use um, path uh, from Unreal. And it's actually read by Unreal as an input. So I'm just going to remove this. And I'm going to go to the HDA. And here... Uh, under the pole, I'm going to just drag this object one value to the pole folder. And I'm going to apply and accept. Okay. And also, actually, it's a kind of a um, side tracking, but something I want to say as well is that when you create folders uh, in Houdini, they default to tabs, uh, which is working perfectly well and looking really nice in the Houdini itself. But I, for instance, I really don't like the look of them here in, uh, in Unreal, especially since it has this really refreshing really thing that uh, if you create more of them, I'm going to drag more to show it if you create more of them i'm gonna rebuild they actually get cut and you can't scroll through them really so if you have like more parameters you can't really go over there so something i do just for like um making the tool look nice uh, is i default them to to collapsible folders also you know if you want to see like how exactly all these parameters and etc look in houdini you can go here to parameters and here it shows, you know, that's how integers are displayed, that's how flows are displayed, and also there's somewhere how, yeah, how tabs and folders are displayed. Uh, so there are two of them that actually look nice, I think. Uh, so I usually use the collapsible one. Collapsible one, and I'm gonna put this one as simple. So I'm gonna apply and accept. Oh, maybe also the noise one as simple. Oh, it's already as simple, perfect. And I'm gonna remove these that I've created earlier. Apply, accept, and save. Okay, rebuild. Uh, so now they look like this. And the collapsible ones just have an arrow that yeah, you can collapse. And the simple ones you can't collapse. They're just more like a header, uh, which I, I think this is like uh, fits Unreal Interface and I like it very much, very much more. Uh, okay, so I see that our beams uh, have been reset, which is okay. Uh, actually, okay, our okay, no, our beams have been uh, have been broken because I changed the, the folder type. So I'm just going to quickly put it back. As, uh, as tabs, I think it was. No, it was, sorry, it was multi-param blog. Yeah, sorry, I didn't notice. I completely forgot about that uh, little important detail. So now it should work back, and if not, I'm gonna redrag them, it's okay. Yeah, now it's, sorry. Yeah, this must be a multi-param blog, obviously, because of the of the uh, functionality. Let me just drag them back. Okay. Okay, so now let's go. Stop working. I'm gonna just ignore it for a bit. 
uh, and you can just drag it back um, in a second. I'm gonna just go back to this. Okay, never mind. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fix it. I'm gonna fix it. Uh, let's just remove this. Delete, delete, and show invisible as well. And this one we made it invisible. Apply accept. And now over here we have the randomize one. Let's put one as default. Delete channels. Delete channels. Put it on the whole the channels. Yeah. Okay. I hate this. And now it's gonna drag it again over here. Hope it's gonna be okay now. Realize I kind of need it. Okay. It's okay now again. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so let's go back to this beam. So as you can see, the object merge node that I um, put down here, now it's uh, displayed the same way as the inputs are. Um, so here we can choose, you know, we can choose the pole that we have. And, you know, th the cool thing is now Houdini actually can read information about it. Um, so we can't really see it here in Houdini because, yeah, the Houdini goes first and then it goes Unreal. But actually there's like a bunch of information being imported together with it. So we're gonna use one of these options that I've mentioned earlier. That is um, that you can use only together with uh, like not the free license. So basically all, all other ones. I'm gonna save it to be sure. I'm gonna control S as well, and I'm gonna um, close Houdini. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up Houdini from Unreal itself. So I'm gonna uh, let's go here to Houdini Engine, and I'm gonna choose Open Houdini Session Sync. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna open up Houdini. Uh, that is actually linked to Unreal so because when usually, you know, when the whole Houdini plugin, what it does is just runs a version of Houdini without interface in the background, and this option just shows that interface that you can like actually manipulate. So here we just have this one subnetwork with global nodes that's empty, um, but when the moment we press rebuild, we're gonna get a bunch of nodes over here, and you can see this is, you know, the structure that we've been using that we have in Unreal. Uh, so I'm just gonna. Uh, unhide all of these so there's no clutter and usually you just need to choose the one that I mean you always just need to choose the one that has the same name as your HDA because all of these are just like different object merges with uh, with the inputs that are uh, that they are used that uh, get here from Unreal if you go to this HDA you can see exactly the same curve that we put down like down here in Unreal uh, and then you this one is locked so if you go in uh, to the HDA as you can see this is exactly our HDA you can't uh, edit it yet you can just right click and press uh, allow editing of contents and go back and here you can see now I'm highlighting the, the object merge one and there's you know we have some path here and we can see the pole itself over here which is really exciting because now we can actually use the information from that pole to like drive our systems so this you know this all works exactly like it was earlier um, but now we can just take this pole and we can, for example, take its size and offset the beams um, according to this. So here, um, if you go, if you go to the peak, uh, right? Yeah, we've been using this size value all the time, which we don't really use anymore in our tool even. Uh, so now instead of this, we can just take uh, bbox. So this is called bbox function called bbox. Uh, from first we need a string with path to uh, where which bbox we want. So I'm, I usually name it like object merge pole or something. Uh, so here, object merge pole this one, and then we need to choose which value we want. So uh, here are the possible values that you want. To, you, we can choose. So I want to uh, use the x size. Uh, and the size of the bounding box of the pole on X. Uh, so D underscore X size. I have a typo. Okay, cool. And now if I click here, you can see that there is a value input here, but it's really nice. And also it needs to be divided by two. Okay, and now we don't have the... Uh, we I didn't import the beams yet, so we can also put the width of the beams. I'm not going to do it because it's just the same process. Uh, but now if we save this, okay. And we have an issue. Let's rebuild. Let's see if it's gonna get fixed. Because also the thing with Houdini uh, plugin, it's it's really buggy. It's really buggy, and sometimes stuff doesn't work not because it's your fault, but uh, because the link just kind of doesn't work. So for example, here you can see Houdini is like kind of crashing, <laughs> um, and it's okay. It, it happens all the time actually. Uh, so I'm just gonna force quit it. Close the program. Okay. 
Okay, and now you can see this red uh, red text Houdini session lost, which means that there's no Houdini engine running in the background. So we just need to go to Houdini engine and create a new one. And now we press rebuild. All is good back. Okay, so that's usually how you fix stuff. Uh, and now you can see the the beams are actually in front of the poles, um, which is uh, which is what we wanted. So that's what I want to show you. That you know one thing that's additional that you can again change about it is that. Um, and also, like, I love the Houdini sessions thing because usually it updates, if it doesn't crash, it updates real life between the Houdini and Unreal, which is great. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, which is great because uh, if I open it up again, I'm going to show it because it's, it's really, really cool. Um, let's go back to Houdini. Again, we have we have nothing. We need to rebuild first to see it. It's an important, something that I've been forgetting all the time when I uh, was learning this feature first. Uh, you know, we, we, here is our uh, curve, but then you can just, you know, take it. You can move it somehow. It's gonna, is it gonna crash again? Okay, no, okay. So here it's not visible anymore. You know, we have to rebuild. Uh, but here, as you can see, the the line changed as well, and it's also a really nice way of seeing um, like different bugs. If something doesn't work in Unreal, but it works in Houdini, you can see exactly what's ha what's happening. Um, and that's, 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 I, I love working that way. And I usually like just make a dummy HDA and I start working with the Houdini live sync like straight away uh, when I create my tool. Uh, so yeah, if you want to, you know, that doesn't work, just rebuild, it's going to work again. Um, so it's all Gucci. And there's just one more thing I want to show because, uh, right now we have the poll, but, uh, the information about what acid it is, is actually uh, took from this string over here, right? But the information about the size is took from this input. So we probably would like to make it the same somehow. Uh, so we can do it. Um, this is the last thing I want to show about this tool. It was kind of like a workaround that I found and I want to share it. Share it. Um, so how we can do it is, you know, we can do it the way that we did it before. So we can do copy two points and then we copy these two points. And you can probably already tell this is a very bad idea uh, because it's just going to create new geometry like we did earlier and we don't need to do it because we can just instance it. So here, uh, if you click on it uh, and you go to points, you can actually see that this creates uh, or primitives primitives there's a lot of information actually um carried over to go with object merge there's the material that is using um the slot of the material that uh, primitives are using so if you have more materials and also this thing which is unreal input mesh name which if you go over here to when we've been instancing it it's exactly this part of the string right so we can use it and we can combine this string with the end part and, and the um and the, uh, the start part and the end part to actually, you know, use uh, the path that's carried over here in the in, in the attribute, okay? So we're gonna do it inside of attribute wrangler and I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna call it uh, poll combine uh, instance, something like that. Um, and here I'm gonna put this as the first input and the curve as the uh, input zero. Uh, so first and, first and second, zero and one. Uh, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna make the attribute Unreal Instance, and again, something, it's gonna default to float, so we need to put S in front to tell, hey, this is a string. Um, so string Unreal Instance, and then we're gonna use a function concat that uh, combines strings. So you can see, you can just put all the different strings in the brackets and it's gonna combine it. So the first part of the string is this part. This is the first part of the string. Then the uh, last part of the string, is the same thing and the middle part uh, is gonna be this parameter so we can use some vex again to retrieve that you can just uh, simple function use many times primitive then you say from which input is gonna be taken so from second input so number one uh, then then a name of the parameter which in our case is unreal input mesh name unreal input mesh name and then uh, it's the number of the primitive, so zero is okay because all of them have exactly the same uh, attribute. So now I'm gonna just plug it in instead of um, the attribute create we had here. And if we go over here, you can see over here we have no primitives, we have only points, and these points should have the Unreal Instance attribute with exactly the same. Okay, I can't really expand this. I can expand this. We have exactly the same input, so it all should be good. Um, I have crossed. Fingers crossed, it will be good. Uh, let's rebuild. Nothing has changed, this is perfect. And now as you can see, I'm gonna change it over here. It's not gonna work anymore because we're not using this. We should actually delete it, like 
bunch of stuff here. But this poll over here, it's changing now not only the um, the asset, but also the offset over here, which is, I think, really, really nice. Yeah, the downside of it, it is actually creating one asset, um, sadly. So if I go to back to here and I change this to poll, okay, I can see I have a bunch of yeah, instance adding mesh components. Uh, but if I would bake it, let's bake it. Let's bake it and move it. And I click on this one. Uh, then I think you can see, oh, this is instant this poll, but somewhere here, I should see a generated instance, instance, instance. Well, okay, I guess when I was doing uh, tries, it was like always generating one uh, one poll that it was you know, instancing later, that it was like using for the size, and but it was just one poll, so I don't want to say this is actually not a big deal, uh, but it looks like it's not doing it, unless it's somewhere here, but I don't really feel like uh, looking for it. No, I don't, I don't see it. Yeah, no, I guess I guess it's I guess it's okay. Cool. And uh, then there's there's no there's nothing generated. Or maybe there is. But even if there is, there's just one poll, so I don't think it's a that big of a deal. Uh, so that's the way uh, that I just want to show the object merge thing, because first of all it just looks nicer for the user uh, when you have the tool itself to like actually choose an asset from like a menu like this and not, you know, dragging a string. And second of all, because you get access to information like materials, like uh, like size, as I showed that you can use uh, later in your tool. Uh, so that's that's it for the fence. And now, um, you know, again, you can expand it however you want to. And now the last part of the workshop, a uh, quick question from me, because we were supposed to go also over like the beginning of the building tool. Uh, so this is again in the sources. Uh, these two courses uh, are great uh, for the building tools. It's, it's, like it's probably gonna be some more in like uh, in the future, but I know these are like the two big ones that uh, taught me like almost everything I needed. Um, so this one is really old course actually. Uh, by Anastasia Opara, great technical artist. It's a really, really long course. Uh, it, it has like five parts and every part is like four hour long or something like that. It has lots of vex, it's really old Houdini. Um, and it shows how to create um, these um, th these houses exactly. Uh, took her wondering, I think as well. But what's cool is that it used to be paid, uh, but now the first volume is free. Exactly. Uh, now it's only, the first part is only $1. Uh, she, she made it free right now and the rest of parts are, are paid. Um, but this, the, the first part already like shows everything that I will show in my, like the first part has everything that I needed, for example, for my, for my building tool. Um, you know, the next ones are just show more, like not really more advanced stuff, but they just show the little details and how to make them. But the base, the, the whole base for the building tool, it's here in the volume one. So just go and take it. Uh, it's, it's great. Again, just, I've heard opinions that, um, there's some stuff that is made with Vex, but you could just use a note for it, but that's okay. Vex is, Vex is great. Um, and another source, it's, uh, from the Project Titan building tool. So Project Titan is a project that, uh, Houdini, that side effects, um, funded some time ago to, that took a bunch of artists and they told them, hey, make a project when like almost everything is Houdini tools. And then they made tutorials on how they made it. Really, really cool stuff. Uh, check it out. And one of the buildings, uh, that the tools that they made was building tool. And actually something that, um, it, it just it just shows actually the building uh, used with like, literally building node <laughs> that's inside of Houdini. Um, yeah, totally. Um, so that's why I also, uh, I will also say, uh, that's why I'm also linking to this one, uh, because this actually makes everything from scratch and doesn't use magic building uh, node. But something that's really great about this one is it uh, shows the linking uh, between Houdini and Unreal very well. Um, so, for example, from this tutorial, I learned how to use the data tables, which, as you saw, like I like when you want to access size information, one of the uh, methods I shown you that you just make it as an object merge, and then you have the size information. Uh, but you can also like just put the values in there um, uh, in, in like a little data table notebook. It's okay. It's a bit too much talking, uh, but sometimes it's really useful for like user experience. Uh, it's it's way nicer here that data tables. This this video, uh, so. Also check it out. Uh, th these two videos were basically the base for like what I've created. Um, so now let's uh, let's go to this and this one. So uh, first of all, uh, maybe I'm gonna open up this uh, HDA in, in Unreal itself. Uh, so I'm gonna export this. Or I think I have it already saved somewhere over here. Yeah, I have it. So let's maybe open it up in Houdini. It put it in the right folder. Okay, so again, right now nothing's gonna happen because there's no inputs. So I'm just gonna, you know, place a bunch of cubes, uh, because that's how that uh, the tool works. 
There's a bunch of cubes. Let us make two of them. Like so. And let's take this tool and let's use it. Change this to words outliner because I, I didn't change it. Uh, I forgot. And let's take all both of these and use current selection. Okay. And here it is. Uh, now something that I also do, also learned from this course, is uh, I take to these, I take these cubes, not these cubes. This is the hood needle. This is not the hood needle. Okay, whatever. Uh, and I go to hidden in game. So then when you press G, you can just hide and hide it, which is really really nice. Uh, and I'm just gonna put a material on top of it because you can also just do it. I have the material over here. Here. Okay. Okay, it's placed also on the windows. Uh, let us make sure that it's placed only on this one. So over here. Okay. Yeah, so this is more or less like the result I'm gonna show. Again, not really, it's not really impressive, but I'm gonna show in a second that um, it's actual like this, like the actual tool is really not <laughs> much more complicated. Uh, so how this is done, let's check it out. Uh, I'm gonna just close these, this as well. Uh, I'm gonna open it up in the, oh yeah. By the way, you sh never should uh, close the Houdini session sync just like I did, but I keep forgetting about this because it just looks like Houdini. So I'm just gonna close and open it again. Rebuild. Uh, hide these and go to building. Okay, and uh, building contents and press F to find it. Uh, so the thing is, whenever you have an input from Unreal, uh, it looks pretty weird. <laughs> what I mean is triangulated. Uh, it has a bunch of uh, attributes as well. Uh, so this is also something that the linking is, is really useful. Uh, add is because these parameters actually sometimes like make your tool just not work uh, and it's really nice to just see um what's going on here exactly and why stuff doesn't work uh, so i just wanted to show that yeah stuff stuff is getting passed by to unreal uh, so the first uh, step that like, this whole method that i'm showing right now I, I took it from the procedural lake houses course so it's there explained more in depth uh, as well so what i'm doing is i take these cubes uh, and i'm changing them to uh, vdb actually and i'm changing them back to polygons straight away. And why I'm doing it is because it's just kind of like a Boolean operation, uh, but it's, I'm not actually sure if it's faster, uh, but uh, this creating lots of points over the surface is actually something that I want, because then I want to create it, uh, snap it to the grid. So in order to snap it to the grid, it's a really uh, simple vex. What, what I'm doing is uh, I'm rounding up uh, position to some kind of value, because now I, I've put it like this, you know, just divided by one, put by one, just so it's really visible. Because there, this is just like a, this kind of trick in mathematics that if you want to round up any number to any other increment, you can just divide it and multiply it by it. So if you want to um, do something to like round something up to four, you can just divide it by four, then round it, and then multiply it by four back. Um, so that way you can just basically choose uh, create a grid with like any size that you want. So right now this is you know one and one, but I can put two over here and then it's gonna be two, two, five, and two. It sometimes triangulates. <laughs> that's uh, that's only one of parts that, that you just kind of need to account for when you make a tool like that. I'm just gonna leave it on one right now, and that's you know this is like a really nice base. And obviously we have uh, lots of points over there, uh, like so. So we need to fuse them, and then we have a really nice clean geometry that we can really like start working straight away. Uh, so for example, like you know we can. I for example, I, something I did in my tool uh, is I also took. Like I, I got a value from the lowest and the highest point, uh, and then based on this, I divided it by the number of floors that um, I, I, I calculated how many floors will, would there fit, and then I divided these values by number of floors to get the, the right height, and I did just a bunch of these calculations uh, because sometimes that grid, uh, if you put it like on bigger values, it really restricts and it really moves the original. Uh, like if we go to the original building, you know, it's always gonna move a little bit, obviously because. Um, uh, because uh, there is, it needs to be restricted to the grid. Uh, so, so I did all these calculations just so it would stay in the same place, like more like more or less, because sometimes it could really move like, you know, uh, two meters up or something like that. Um, so that's why I did so. So just like some um, ideas here for uh, more advanced stuff. So then we fuse it and then we uh, assign basic attributes to it. So the ba basic, basic attributes, uh, you, you can just split it uh, to top, bottom and wall uh, by the normals. Right, so the uh, normal bigger uh, y normal bigger than zero is uh, is the roof, the the floor, and the wall, and then you can separate them to these individual pieces, and that's where you can build from. 
So something that I did again in the building, by the way, that's the, the building tool that I keep talking about. Maybe I'm gonna show it because uh, I'm just gonna kind of assuming that um, everybody saw it. It's that one. Okay, so just to like go straight away to the uh, to the overview. That's how it more or less works. Um, yeah, and that, that's how like the, the the ending shows. So whenever I say like, oh, I did it that way because of something, that's because I very much wanted to have this kind of an end result. So again, something I did in my tool is I also have platforms, as you can see. So I not only split it to bottom, top and wall, but I also mark it as platform. And the way I do it is, um, uh, the way I did it uh, is I believe I put it, um, okay, now I'm actually, <laughs> I actually, I think I've, um, I think, you know, what I do it? Actually, not sure. Oh yeah, I know how to do it. Uh, I just checked uh, before, um, w w when I, after I fuse them, I just check if the width, if the height of like the a connected piece is like smaller than some margin. Uh, and then it's like, because it's super thin, then it's a platform, I mark it as platform, I separate it as, as platform. Um, and then I have another type over here with platform, right? So now I just want to show like one of the things I did, uh, like it was like my, my first step kind of when I was making my tool was creating windows. So this base is, is, is okay, right? It's just a cube. Uh, but you know, all the buildings are just cubes. Uh, so I, what I did to make windows is that I had a bunch of rules for windows where I want to place them. So I first of all wanted to get rid of spaces um, where I didn't want these windows to be placed. So first of all, I didn't want them to be placed on corners. So this is just a simple group node uh, where, where I um, include the, oops, uh, include the primitives uh, next to sharp edges. So these are the corners and I blast them away. Then I'm thinking like, oh, I want them actually to be only every second. So I don't want them to be next to each other because this is way too close. So what I did is I separated them uh, to pieces uh, and then I sorted, uh, wait, see it one by one, single pass, let's take some thing, okay. So this is like, you know, a single uh, piece that's uh, that's connected uh, together. So I sorted them uh, by uh, by the Y. Uh, so the, because some, because like by default, if I don't, if you don't sort them, uh, after that, I, I'm just uh, grouping every second primitive number uh, to be um, to be two deletion. But sometimes, you know, they're like um, they're like still next to each other because the numbers are not even. So I just sort them just to be sure that uh, the numbers are gonna be proper. Uh, and then I blast every second, and that's how I do it. So these are like the only options that the windows can be now. And you know, then I make a point cloud. And again, this method of making a point inside is from this video with how to create a point in the center of primitives. Uh, so he showed there like this is how you can just make a point at the uh, in the position of the primitive, and you can copy the normals from it and remove the primitive itself. And that's how you create a point in uh, in the center of some primitives. Uh, for example, and that's how I did in, in that case, and I did it mostly just so then I can also add the attribute, and I can just make or have all the effects in the same in the same node block. And also, you know, this looks pretty basic, um, but there's, there was obviously more rules to the windows. For example, something I did as well is that sometimes when I have structures, like actually exactly like in here, so like a tall uh, towers, I wanted them to be above each other. So what I did is I deleted everything besides the first floor and I copied the points over to the top. And then I said, wherever there's an intersection between the point and the face and the primitive, uh, that's where, where, where there's gonna be a window. And there's just actually a bunch of more rules like that of where to place windows. Uh, and then in the end, you just put set these points or windows, you merge this together. Uh, and I also decided in my building tool, uh, because there's also, you know, there's multiple uh, approaches. What you can do is you can, for example, decide, okay, so I want these buildings uh, to be made out of modular pieces. I have modular walls that I can put, and all of these walls are, let's say, three meters wide. So you can just make this grid three meters wide over here. Um, and then you just place these pieces, right? Or maybe you can, uh, but what I what I decided to do is because I realized that, um, like I was thinking, do I want to do modularly? Do I want to uh, generate it? And I realized that um, that I think that in my case, it's going to be the best, the easiest if I uh, make the base of the building. So just like the basic cubes, the basic shapes generated in Houdini. Uh, and then I just instance windows and stuff like that on top. Uh, so uh, this is what I did. Uh, so I just unwrapped it uh, like this. And then I, you can also, you know, here, I put the material um, directly on the model, but you probably want to do it with an Unreal Material parameter. So if you go to the parameters, there's also an Unreal Material instance a parameter uh, that you can use, or I think just Unreal Material as well uh, for materials and stuff like that. Uh, so this is the beginning, and you know after this, uh, you basically have yeah an output like here, but the windows has have disappeared for some reason. 
uh, I'm just gonna rebuild it. This really works. Yeah, here you go. Uh, you and again you can add more windows, right? Uh, and then you know this is actually like uh, you know this looks like hey this is nothing like you were supposed to show us a building tool but this is nothing. But then actually when you know whenever you have 3D graphics stuff you know is actually way easier or like it's way simpler than you would think it is. So if you look at these buildings actually okay this is you know like over here because this is like uh, let's say not really like decorated over. This is just a cube that I just showed you, and then it just has a beam at every floor. So how to create a beam? I literally showed today with the with the fence tool, right? We had some kind of line, and then we put a plank on top and we scaled it. That's how you can also create a beam like this. Uh, but actually, what I did here is I have a bunch of beams that have one meter, two meters, three meters, four meters long, and then I with vex. Um, I choose which uh, length is the closest and then I scale it. So that's so to avoid stretching because yeah, some of these walls are 10 meters long and some of them are one meter long. So that's why I did that. And because they also have some, uh, in the asset itself are a bit crooked as well. So then you have beams and this, you know, it has another complexity level. And then you're like, oh, you can also add spikes here. And it's basically like the same the same place, right? You can just resample it, have some distance, you have spikes. And then you have the, the roofs, which are, okay, they're a bit more complicated uh, when you have like complicated structures. But when you have, you know, just like one rectangle, you just move one edge up and then you put the planks on top with the same normals and uh, normals equals orientation as the plane below, right? Then you have the windows, I literally just showed. Then you have the platform. So after you decorate platforms, you just extrude it. You put beams here. You can you place beams here as a as a fence. And it's all it's, it's all actually really simple when you like um when you put it when, when you say put it like that, right? Because it's all just repeated actions, it's all just instancing. You just whenever you're you know modeling uh, modeling something when you whenever you set dressing an environment in Unreal, you're just copying stuff around and you just need to think about like rules how do you actually put it around? And you have only three things to manipulate. You have location, rotation, and scale to manipulate. And you just need to see how to manipulate it in order to create something more that's looking more advanced. But actually, you know, this we we I think we know all know it when we were learning modeling that all models are just cubes <laughs> in the end. Uh, so that's that's how the building um, tool starts. Like even if you look at the final artwork, like this part here, this is exactly what I showed you. It's just beams here, spikes. And this is just a this is just a cube, right? Uh, and then I just put twenty decals on it to make it look pretty. Um, okay, yeah. So I think this is it. If you have any more questions about the building tool itself, uh, hit it up. Uh, I also like the, the I wanted to show the file itself, uh, but this is so messy that I was just like, this, this there's no point. And <laughs> uh, it's it, it was it, it's really big uh, and it's really messy because uh, I was also learning while I was doing it, right? So uh, yeah, that's it. I think we can we can move to the Q and A. Thank you so much, Michalina, for taking the time to share this amazing workshop and the accompanying resources for live participants for us at Beyond Extend. Make sure to check out their work in the description below. We also want to throw out a big thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. These workshops are only possible because of your support. Head on over to beyondextend.com where you can find access to our community, environment art resources, and get access to these live Q&A sessions that always accompany these workshops. Stay creative and I'll see you there.